So for people who wonder what kind of relevance Marcos Garvey has for 2023, what would you say to them? Oh, wow. Uh, if we ever needed Marcus Garvey before, we sure do need him now. Uh, Mr. Garvey has a timeless, time-honored message that um, is always needed. You know, people think somehow if you get a certain status, a certain freedom, a certain level of independence, that you can just stop there and it just maintains itself. But whenever we lose and think we're making progress, we actually start to regress. We have to look at our history, uh, which Mr. Garvey is the example. He's the gold standard. He's the model of success that we need uh, in order to see how to begin to develop our own industries, to develop uh, our own political systems, like the Universal Negro Political Union. He was a master at organizing people, mobilizing people, and creating institutions that fit our needs at any given time based upon certain universal principles. And those principles, again, are time honored. So, um, you know, today we still need justice. We're still marching for things that we haven't uh, been able to control. Uh, we're still, unfortunately, begging for things that we should be producing for ourselves. You know, we're still dependent in many ways. But Mr. Garvey taught us self-determination, self-reliance, self-respect. And those uh, principles that are, you know, going to be needed, you know, eternally. So, yeah, I, I would say his message is still relevant in every way imaginable, as, just as much as it was uh, back in his day. That's why I recall him the, the standard bearer of success under duress who was blessed to do far more with less. Okay, you are the international organizer and historian. What, what does your role um, entail precisely? Well, as international organizer, I have one job, and that's to kill the worst enemy of our race, disorganization. And organizing means that sometimes we need ideas, sometimes we need plans, sometimes we need uh, just to be told our condition, you know, as Mr. Garvey said, that um, con you know, when all else fails, conditions will organize us. You know, don't agonize, organize. When we see we have problems in the community, there's always a solution, and there's always something that is self reliant, you know, a power that's exclusive that we need to develop and build. And in order to, um, you know, to get the things that we need, you know, too often we want to ask others to do things for us that we can do for ourselves. And they always, as quickly as they give it, they can quickly take it away from us. But when we begin to liberate our minds and ultimately our bodies, we begin to see things a lot differently and we begin to organize communities to produce, like I said before, political institutions, uh, economic financial institutions, uh, credit unions, um, you know, uh, Saturday schools, you know, our own schools, our own clinics, our own hospitals, everything that we need to sustain life and to be productive citizens, we need to be able to come together, um, recognize our common need, and then develop institutions and put our, our resources into whatever we need. You know, so my job as organizer is to kind of share some of that knowledge and you know try to reach those who don't know or are not aware of their situation uh, as they ought to be. They're kind of content or complacent uh, with the way things are today, and you know I know things can be a lot better. And uh, historian. Uh, I was thrust in the position of historian years ago when I was um, nominated to join the UNIA, uh, what was it, the uh, Elder Commemoration Program uh, at, the, at, one, at the 2003 convention of the UNIA in Philadelphia. And when I took that role on, I began to interview a lot of elders who were 80, 90, and some of them 100 plus years old who began to tell me about the history of the UNIA that's not written in the books. And as I began to see that there was a lot of material that's not written in the books that um, our people have never heard, you know, um, stories about the royal um, uh, engineers, you know, as well as the Royal African Guard, stories about the Black Eagle and the Black Eagle Flying Corps, stories about, you know, uh, certain hardships and um, triumphs as well as tragedies that the UNIA encountered and faced, uh, Mr. Garvey's persecution, etc. I began to see that the story of our history hasn't really been properly told uh, thoroughly enough and most of the time you get the story is from those who are outside the movement and those who really don't appreciate the magnitude and the so they try to water down the movement they try to just you know uh, credit the movement or they try to marginalize the 
significance of the movement. You know, so you'll hear about some back to Africa movement, which is not a term that we ever adopted. It was actually a negative, pejorative term that people use uh, uh, for the movement. Um, we were an African redemptionist movement. You'll hear them, you know, talk about Garvey as self-appointed leader and all kinds of nonsense that's, that's just not true. And so, in order to protect that history, uh, I've started different uh, inst uh, publications. I've uh, produced. I actually just um, writing, and trying to finish up a book uh, on the history of the Garvey movement. But also, um, I have a few websites uh, on Facebook and trying to expand to you know Twitter and some of the other media to uh, share a more accurate history of the movement so that people can get a better grasp of um, the value of the movement and hopefully you can learn from its legacy and, and begin to join and you know uh, embrace its principles and ideology.